Let's come in our Bibles this evening to the book of Leviticus, please, and chapter 19. The book of Leviticus and chapter 19. It has been my joy and my delight to be with you throughout the week. I want to thank you very much for your support. Uh, some of you have been here every night. Some of you have really made a great effort, and we really appreciate that. We know we live in busy times, and so we want to thank you very much. And thank you for coming out tonight. I do thank George again for the kind words of welcome and for the church here just for the opportunity to come and share uh, the Word of God. We're coming to Leviticus chapter 19 over this week. George had asked me to speak on, uh, on end times, on prophetic themes, uh, and I tried to, uh, to pick out prophetic themes perhaps that hadn't been preached before or not perhaps preached for some time. Uh, we looked at globalization on Monday night and how the world's becoming a smaller place on Tuesday night. Uh, it was anti-Semitism. And again, that's probably a subject you've heard uh, many times. On Wednesday night, we looked at the age of travel and how knowledge will increase. And again, I think we can see it clearly uh, around us today. Last night, we were at the days of Lot. And on our way home, our first minister was even dealing with the same a subject that's never far from the news. It's never far from events. And it always reminds me, indeed, that we're living, I believe, in the last days. Perhaps tonight's subject, I was going to say, is the craziest of them all. Perhaps tonight's subject's the strangest of them all. I don't know. Maybe some of you will uh, correct me at the door. Uh, but I would doubt many have heard a message about tattoos in any sense, but particularly in a prophetic meeting. And again, you can correct me on the way out if, if you have before, uh, but it's something that, that I feel the Lord led me to, and I was, I was sharing with George one day uh, that I had been studying it, and he said, well, would you preach that message in Kilkeel? And I says, of course uh, I will. And so that's the subject we want to look at this evening. Uh, could I say that we're not being judgmental? I, I think tonight if you're saved and perhaps you had tattoos in your unsaved days, don't, don't you worry about that. That's under the blood. And I was saying to someone tonight, the preacher you had here last Sunday, he's got a big tattoo in his arm. And if, some, if he's ever back again, you ask him, and maybe he'll show you his tattoo. Uh, and so there's plenty of people. Kenny and I used to be involved in outreach in Cookstown uh, with the Coke and the, Baptist, the Cookstown Baptist Church. We worked together. And there used to be a man with us, and he's now in the Brethren, but uh, he told us one time about he went to get a tattoo of King Billy on the horse. Uh, and he went and he got the horse, and it was so sore, he never went back for a billy. And so <laughs> he's got the horse, and he's got no billy. And, uh, well, he's in the brethren now, so they can work with him whatever way uh, they like. And so we, we're not being judgmental. There may be uh, some tonight, you're not saved and you have a tattoo. Don't you worry about that. Uh, that'll not hinder you from coming to Christ. And it'll certainly not hinder Christ from accepting you in any way. There may even be some of God's people who have been considering getting one. There may be some who have, even since they were saved, and maybe it's not something you thought much about. Well, sit easy tonight and just hear what the Word of God has to say. But we want to look at this subject this evening, coming to Leviticus chapter 19. Sometimes we're, uh, we're, we're told, well, what you read in Leviticus, that's for then, it's not for now. Uh, that's the law, it's not grace. That's Old Testament, it's not New Testament. Well, look at verse 1 in Leviticus chapter 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This passage is about God's holiness. And this passage is about you and I as God's people living holy lives. That means it's important for now. It wasn't just for then. It's important for tonight. And God uh, deals with some subjects here, that uh, things that would challenge believers about holy living. Look at verse number 3. I'm not going to, I'm going to go through all of these. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. There's a couple of the commandments there. Uh, we're to honor our mother and father. We are uh, to remember the Sabbath day. And so again, we wouldn't want to say that's for then and it's not for now. I believe the Lord would want us to honor our parents. Repeated in the New Testament, I believe the Lord would want us to remember the Lord's day and to keep it special. I believe that's God's will for your life and for my life as a child of God. Look at verse number four. Turn you not unto idols. 
or make to yourselves molten gods. There have no other god before me and no graven images. You can see. You can see that God's setting out here what, what it means to live a holy life. And none of us would say, well, that's for then and not for now. And so I'm just trying to show you from this passage this evening that you cannot pick and mix the Bible just to suit. Look down to verse number 9. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, and shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Now, this is a, a, an old Testament thing that when the farmer was uh, harvesting the grain, uh, he would harvest it, but he'd leave the corners of the fields. And the corners would be left for those who were less well off, and they would come and they would glean and take the gleanings. Do you remember the book of Ruth? Ruth was a gleaner. And she went in when the harvest was lifted. And, of course, Boaz, who, who had an eye for her, he left her handfuls on purpose. But again, it's just about caring for those who are not so well off. We couldn't say that's for then and not for now. We couldn't say, well, that was okay then. It's not something we would want to adhere to now. And there's many other things as well. Look at verse 11. Ye shall not steal. Well, that speaks for itself. Uh, doesn't it? Verse 12, Ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane in the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Verse 13, Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wage of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until morning. And these things are so straightforward. None of us would dare say, well, it wasn't right to steal then, it's okay to steal now. None of us would be so silly tonight. Look at verse 14, Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but thou shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. I, I think a, a sign of a child of God is, is a care for those who are handicapped, those who are not uh, mentally well, and those who have certain physical handicaps. That's something that's taught here. They were to be careful with those who were handicapped in any way. Of course, that's not something we would discard in the New Testament. Don't think any of us would try to argue something as foolish as that this evening. Verse 15 talks about not being partial. Verse 16, thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer. That's a slanderer. Of course, we weren't to slander in the Old Testament. Well, we certainly wouldn't want to slander in the New Testament either. Look at the end of verse number 18. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Look at verse 19. Sometimes this is thrown up. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with a mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. Now, if you go back into the history, some people will say, well, there you are. You can't wear a clothes that's got mixed fibers. And they're saying, you see, that was for then and not for now. This was to do with Canaanite practice. This was to do with idolatry and paganism. And God wanted His people to be different. God wanted His people to be separate. doesn't mean you can't wear mixed garments tonight, but that was the situation then, and it was to do with idolatry, and it was to do with paganism, something uh, indeed that uh, we would still want to avoid in the 21st century. I'm not going to read verse number 20. You can glance at it, but you can see none of us would ever uh, dare argue that that's something that was not right then, but it's okay now. Let's just come down to verse 28. Here's the key verse. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And God will bless the reading of His own precious and fallible and errant and inspired word to our hearts this evening. And I just went through that passage to show you that you can't just throw out the book of Leviticus and say that's for then, but not for now. Yes, there were things that were ceremonial that we're not connected with this evening, but when you read a chapter like that, it's, it's God's moral law mostly and things that we would want to learn from this evening. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard of a, uh, of a man called Matt Banham. I have to say I hadn't heard about him before I started to look into this subject. He, he's a rugby player. He played for England and uh, a team called Bath. And this is what he said, my whole forearm is lucky. On my arm, I've got an ace of spades. I've got a pin-up lady sitting inside a horseshoe, and I have a lucky dice. My first tattoo was a four-leaf clover, and I got it on my 18th birthday. 
It is one of my most sacred ones. The 29-year-old rugby player is just one of many celebrities who sport tattoos in this day. Names like David Beckham, Harry Styles, uh, the late Amy Winehouse from the world of sport, the world of music, and, and pop and fashion all seem to be happy for their bodies to be public galleries to display the latest body art work. Even our former Prime Minister, his wife Samantha, had a tattoo on her ankle uh, which she would proudly display from time to time. They were selling t-shirts in England, uh, and this is what it said on them. Uh, they, were, they were to be sold apparently to young ladies. I love booze, shoes, and boys with tattoos. And that seems to be the age in which we're living. Uh, there's a new perspective on the ancient practice of tattooing. On the 29th of August this year, not that long ago, the BBC cried this article. Police officers uh, should be allowed to have tattoos on their hands. This come from the Police Federation, neck and even faces. The Police Federation of England and Wales say it believes a ban on visible tattoos imposed by many forces may hamper the recruitment of promising candidates. And again, I'm just showing you the normalization of tattoos. I'm just showing you how acceptable they have come and how common they are now in society in this day and age. One in five people in the United Kingdom have a tattoo. When you get into young adults, it's one in three. For some reason, they tell us that 14% of teachers have tattoos. I don't know why they single out teachers. Maybe they're supposed to be sensible. I'm not sure. But 14% of teachers have tattoos. Cheryl Cole, I told you the other night, she spent £14,000 on a tattoo that took 55 hours to put upon her body. 59% of all who have a tattoo in the United States are ladies. And so it's not just the men, it's a craze also among the ladies. I want to look at this subject this evening and a few different headings because there's a few angles I want to throw out to you uh, tonight. I know some young people here tonight, there may be other young people who will be watching this later on, and so uh, some of it's just common sense and practical advice. But most of what I say this evening I want to take from the Word of God. Let me say something historically, first of all. Where and when did tattoos begin? Well, as someone has said, a lot of ink has been spilled over this subject. It's difficult to be dogmatic. Some believe it started with ancient civilizations like the Aborigines, Chinese Mayans, or Aztecs. Others think it started in the prison cell or, or perhaps in the armed forces among some of the soldiers. One thing is sure, it's associated in past history with paganism, demonism, Baal worship, shamanism, mysticism, heathenism, even cannibalism, and many other pagan beliefs. Ultimately, ultimately I believe it began with the devil, and I'll tell you why. Over in Genesis 1 verses 26 to 27, we're told that you and I are made in the image of God. In the image of God made he man and woman. And so we are made in the image of God. Anything that disfigures that image, anything that distorts that image, you can be sure that the devil is behind it. History tells us that ancient pagan religions often used tattooing to show a person's commitment to their false god. Idolaters had their idols marked upon their foreheads, their arms, etc. This is according to Nicholson's Bible Students Companion. These are called sectarian marks even to this day among the Hindus and others in India. During the Holocaust, and we mentioned a little about the Holocaust uh, the other evening when we looked at anti-Semitism, Hitler wanted to, to try and shame the Jews as much as he can. And he attacked things that he knew were contrary to the Word of God. He stripped them naked. And if you know anything about Jewish culture about the Word of God, uh, the Word of God is strong against nakedness of any shape, size, or form. For a Jewish person, this was a great shame. He shaved their heads. If you know the Nazarite vow where they weren't allowed to put the razor on the head, again, for some, this was a, a mark of great shame. Another thing he, he did, he marked their bodies with numbers in the form of tattoos. 
Hitler knew what he was doing. He knew this is something that would be abhorrent to the Jew. According to the verse we read this evening, Leviticus 19, verse number 28. Have you ever been in a tattoo parlor? I have been. I don't know what modern ones are like, but they certainly look like seedy joints. If you ever get a, a magazine with tattoos, it, it, you know just to look at it, there's, uh, there's something just unclean about it. When you look at some of the pictures, skulls and snakes and dragons and emblems of death, rude women, pagan symbols, these all heavily feature in the tattoo parlor and the tattoo uh, magazines. Uh, indeed, death is the number one theme of tattoos. Uh, according to the Body Art book, page 56, references from these books tell us that death and darkness have always been a classic tattoo theme, skulls, snakes, and demons. Henry Ferguson in The Art of the Tattoo says, probably the most popular tattooed image of today is the all-pervasive grinning skull. Skulls imprinted on skin abound, and depictions of the Green Ripper are commonly seen. Uh, tattoo shops display scenes of death and demons and serpents and hell and grim reapers and flaming skulls, snakes crawling through skulls, demons, Satan, pornography, blasphemy, naked flames of hell. Practically every scene of hell is glorified. That's why I believe Satan ultimately is the master tattooist. And so when you look into history, when you go into the, uh, the origin of tattoos, you find the association with idolatry and witchcraft and paganism and heathenism and all sorts of things that no child of God would want to be associated with. We could look at it historically tonight. We could look at it practically tonight, and without the Word of God, there's some practical advice. Remember that tattoos are permanent or almost always permanent. They can be surgically removed, but it's expensive, it's, it's painful. One in three person, when they, when they get to an older age, when they reach adulthood, some of them regret having a tattoo for many different reasons. And so even just common sense would tell us to stay away from these things. There are health problems associated with having tattoos. And people run the risk of hepatitis C and AIDS because the little needle punctures the skin 3,000 times a minute. In an hour, that's 180,000 punctures into the skin, opening up the way for various infections. The Daily Mirror said on the 28th of May 2015, one in 10 people have health issues because uh, they have had tattoos. These are just some practical things. Uh, there are health problems. Remember uh, that they're permanent. Damaged reputation. There are still some employers who don't want to employ people who have uh, visible tattoos. I used to be in the lorry business. Some of you know that. Transport manager. Remember a man who used to come in, he sold scanny lorries. When he was young, he got a tattoo on his forearm of the red hand of Ulster. But then he began to sell scanny lorries, and he was traveling into places where the red hand of Ulster just wouldn't endear you to the customers. And so he had it surgically removed. It was very expensive, and it took an awful long time. Sometimes you get things that you'll regret in later years, and you'll find that they hamper you in the job that you want to do. There are programs on television. I've never watched them because they they're a wee bit disgusting. I wouldn't want to watch them, but there's one entitled, What Were You Inking Of? And you can see the play in words because there's so many people get these things and then regret them. I know some of you had tattoos when I was young, and they're, they're obviously a bit older now, and when you look at them, the, uh, the tattoo's all wrinkled and faded, and it really looks awful. I think they look awful anyway, but they particularly look awful when uh, they don't seem to age too well. And these are things, just practical things, that people should keep in mind. Sometimes people do it because of peer pressure, but there will be a time when those peers will not be around. Some because they believe it's fashionable, but of course, fashions change. Some because of a relationship they're in. Wouldn't be the first man got the girlfriend tattooed in the arm, and then it all fell through, and he had to get the name scored out, or perhaps changed to another name. So even from a practical point of view, it makes no sense. Historically, practically. 
Let me say something thirdly, and I've just called this sadly, sadly. Current trend uh, for tattoos is not just confined to the unseen. Some Christians also are, uh, are having their, their bodies marked uh, with this body art so-called. There are Christian tattoo shops that are opening up, and they say that they're tattooing for Jesus. It's fun, it's colorful, it's new. Uh, they say it's not just an activity. It's something that they can do, and they can um, express their, their faith Difficult to get statistics on it, uh, but there are obviously some who find it not only acceptable, but even desirable to have tattoos. Randy Master is a Christian tattoo artist in Bismarck, North Dakota. He sees it as an art form and a ministry. Daniel Ostrowski, who's a minister, runs a tattoo business in Wisconsin. He founded the Christian Tattoo Association. And there are many such groups in the United States. There are quite a number of preachers and, uh, and some of these uh, Christian bands all also openly and proudly display their tattoos. Pathew, uh, Pastor Mike Hazeltine says, I also have a lot of tattoos. The one on my back is a picture of Jesus right out of the book of the Revelation. Obviously, they don't see it as sin on the skin. One lady writing on the internet said this, I think it's very cool to have a small tasteful cross on the back of the base of your neck or upper back, for example. It means you're saved. It means you belong to God. It's a wonderful witness. I'm thinking of marking myself as a Christian. I'm a 58-year-old lady. These are some of the things that are, uh, that are happening uh, throughout the United States and right into the, to the United Kingdom. A number of years ago, even the most liberal Christian knew that the tattoos were clearly forbidden by the Word of God. Right throughout church history, uh, on almost every commentary you happen to read from a bygone age, uh, it pointed out using these verses that tattoos were forbidden by the Word of God. Others have written about how uh, the missionaries come, and, and because of the, the gospel and people being saved, then the tattoos were rejected. Someone has written this, just as occurred in other cultures with tattoo traditions. When these pagan tribes were converted to Christian religion, their spiritual and cultural rights, which included tattooing and piercing, were outlawed. Uh, that's in the body art book. Uh, Gilbert Steve in Tattoo History, a source book, says this, whenever missionaries encountered tattooing, they eradicated it. As I say, a number of years ago, almost every commentary uh, on Leviticus 19, verse 28, said the same thing. J uh, Jemson, Fawcett, and Brown uh, said this, nor print any marks upon you be tattooing, and printing figures of flowers, leaves, stars, and other fanciful devices in various parts of their body. The impression was made sometimes by means of a hot iron, sometimes by ink or paint, as it is done by the Arab females of the present day and the different castes of the Hindus. It is probable that strong propensity to adopt such marks in honor of some idol gave occasion to the prohibition in this verse. And they were wisely forbidden, for they were signs of apostasy. And once that mark was made, there were insuperable obstacles to return. I say that's Jemson, Fawcett, and Brown. James Freeman, in his book, The New Manners and Customs of the Bible, says this, Tattooing was forbidden. Both cutting and tattooing were done by heathens. And so God forbid His people from doing so in imitation of them, the manners and customs of the Bible. Charles R. Edmund in his commentary said this, The custom of tattooing was forbidden. While among all nations of antiquity it was common, uh, Nave's famous topical Bible puts it simply like this, Tattoos forbidden. Any of the commentaries you care to lift of a bygone age, looking at Leviticus chapter 19, said that tattoos were forbidden. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6, verse 17, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be identified with Christ? Bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Paul mean by that? Well, Paul had a few things in mind. He had in mind the, the thought of a slave that was branded as a mark of ownership. He had also the thought of the, of the mark being a mark of shame. If a slave ran away, they would be branded as a mark of shame. He also had the thought of a soldier because it was a mark of allegiance to their generals. If you want to wear the, the marks 
of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, a, it's a mark of shame uh, being prepared to associate it with the rejected Savior. It's a mark of, of loyalty. It's a mark of commitment. The bond slave who was committed totally and wholeheartedly to the Master. It's a mark of faithfulness, being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your life as a believer marked by servanthood, humility, loyalty, and faithfulness? Those are the marks that we want to display in our lives. You see something historically. You see something practically. You see something sadly. Then let's come to what I've just called biblically. Before we look at Leviticus chapter 19, let me throw a few verses out to you this evening. Ephesians 5 verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. If I'm right tonight that tattoos are associated with the occult uh, and with witchcraft and all sorts of uh, pagan worship and idolatry, and we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, then really that should seal it, shouldn't it? 3 John 1 verse 11, Beloved, follow not after that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. What you do with your body, Jesus cares about. It's not my body I can do what I like. The Lord's concerned about what you do with your body. You know, it says this of the judgment seat of Christ, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Romans 14, verse 7, none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to the Lord. And of course, 1 Corinthians 6 reminds us, we are bought with a price, therefore glorify your God in your body. Our body belongs to Christ. And what you do with your body, it does matter to Jesus Christ. I would say to believers tonight, considering getting tattoos, is this something indeed that will glorify or bring honor to Christ? Because it happens to be fashionable, is that how we judge our lives. Remember what Paul says, we're not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If we're going to be changed that we may be like unto his glorious body, is this something that the Lord would want to see in our bodies? But let's come to Leviticus 19, verse 28. And let's look at this verse closely this evening. Notice what it says, ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. You see the word marks. When the King James Version of the Bible was written in 16 and 11, there was no English word for tattoos. And so that's why the word's translated marks. Some of the modern versions have changed it to tattoos, and that's exactly what it is. The word tattoo didn't come into the English language until between 1766 and 1799, and it was Chapman James Cook who brought the word back with him. doesn't mean there weren't tattoos, but they weren't called tattoos, and that's why they used the word marks here in Leviticus 19, verse 28. Another version puts it, puts it like this, Do not cut your bodies for the dead, or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Now, for most of God's people, that should be enough. God says, don't put tattoos on your body. That should seal it, shouldn't it? But then there are those who will look at this and they'll say, that's not for today. That's Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. Well, let me tell you this. In Leviticus 18, verse 23, and Leviticus 20, verse 15 to 16, bestiality is condemned. It's nowhere condemned in the New Testament. I don't think any of us would dare say it's okay for now. Look at the verse beside verse 28. Look at verse 29. I don't have to read that this evening, but you can see what that says. That's the only place in the Bible you'll, you'll find that. And so if you're saying, well, that's the only place where tattoos are condemned, I'm not saying you're saying it, but this is the arguments that we hear, and that's not in the New Testament, we can ignore it. Well, then you should be able to ignore the verse that follows. There's not a father in this building, and there's not a mother either, would want us to believe such a thing. You'd need a greater argument than that. Yes, there are moral laws here, and there are ceremonial things that 
don't apply to us, but this is not one of them. You know there's only one mention uh, about sacrificing children, that's Leviticus 18 verse 21, but of course that doesn't make it right because it's only found in one place. You see, sometimes God's people are always looking for loopholes, aren't they? Uh, the, the cyclist Bradley Wiggins, he, he had these things called the TUEs, they're, they're exemptions. Uh, temperature use exemptions to use certain uh, steroids because of a medical condition. Uh, and some people are suggesting now that really he cheated. I don't know whether he did or not. I don't know enough about it. But athletes are looking for loopholes. People are looking for loopholes. People are looking for loopholes to avoid paying tax and all sorts of things. Sometimes God's people are looking for loopholes to get around the obvious. And they say, well, that's the only place it is then it's not for us, but you're going to have to do a little bit better than that. Then some others will say, well, this was to do with the dead. Look what it says in verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. Now, this was bloodletting, and it was for the dead. It was an ancient Canaanite practice. But you'll notice that itself should be enough uh, to not want anyone to do it or even not to use the argument for the dead. Bloodletting wouldn't be okay no matter what it was for. But notice when it talks about printing marks, there's no attachment to the dead. That's on its own. And so again, that argument won't work uh, this evening. And I could read you some references, but I don't have to. Let me give you the most common argument that's used against this verse. Look at verse 26 in Leviticus 19. I purposely didn't read this. But it's very topical that we're on the eve of Halloween, or in the verge of Halloween. Look at verse 28. Ye shall not need eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment. These are magical arts, demonic things. Nor observe times, that's fortune-telling. These are things that are condemned. I have to say, I, I loathe Halloween. I really do. I really loathe it. I can't stand it. And people have gone Halloween mad. Do you know that 94% of people in the United States do something for Halloween. Forty-four percent of people in the United Kingdom with children do something for Halloween. We spend in the UK three hundred million pounds a year on Halloween. Thirty-three pounds per average household spent on Halloween. I just don't like it. I don't believe a child of God would want anything to do with it at all. And here it's, it's condemned. And so you can see that God's against these things. Then look at verse 27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. And you see, some people pick this up and they say, well, if you're saying you can't have a tattoo, then you can't have a haircut. And if you've got a beard, I've never tried to grow a beard because it always seemed to come out ginger, and so I didn't want a ginger beard. But if you've got a beard, well, you can't clip the corners of the beard. Is God forbidding a haircut. He's spoken about witchcraft. He's speaking about demonology. He's speaking about occultish practice. And then he goes on to speak about bloodletting and tattoos. And right in the middle of it, do you think God's going to talk about a haircut? Do you think that's all it is this evening? Let me read you one commentary on Leviticus 19, 27. Those that worship the hosts of heaven, these are the sun, the moon, and the stars. In honor of them, they cut their hair so as their heads might resemble the celestial globe. If you ever see a monk, the way they have their hair cut sometime, that, that type of hair cut was used as a form of pagan worship. And God says, you don't want to be into pagan worship. It's nothing to do with a hair cut. Nothing to do with trimming your beard. Herodias tells us the use of this type of haircut, forming what's called a tonsure as the practice of pagan religious cults of ancient time who did so honoring one of their gods. You see, I can take all the arguments that people will put up against this verse, and I can say, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're looking for a loophole that's not there. See, historically, when we look at it, you see, practically, you see, sadly, some of God's people are saying it's okay, and I'll say a wee bit in a moment, which will shock you. You see, biblically, I think it's wrong. Let me say something, and I've called it blasphemously. Come over to Revelation 19. We'll be finishing the meeting off in Revelation. This is my last night. You see, I can go on tonight, because if you don't come back, it doesn't matter. 
I usually try and finish in time, but just give me a few moments tonight. Look at Leviticus 19, verse 16. There's a lot of the modern churches take a different view on this than I would take. And one man recently, I heard him preach it. I heard him on tape. And then I got a book on this movement. I'm not going to mention the movement. And I read the book. And I discovered where he got it from. Look at Leviticus 19, verse 16, and then I'll, I'll fill you in in the details. And this probably is what led me to speak on this subject originally or to look into the subject. Leviticus 19, verse 16. And he, this is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back, and he's coming back to the earth. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I've heard a preacher say in Ulster, when Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to have a tattoo on his thigh. So it's okay for you to have a tattoo. Look at the verse again. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now let me say a few things about that, because this is very important tonight. And I feel for some people that are sucked into some of these modern movements. I really feel for them, because I don't think they have any idea what's been taught and how serious it is. This is not just something to joke about tonight, and I'll explain why in a moment. You see, and I've mentioned it already this evening, Jewish people and the Word of God taught that nakedness was frowned upon, even revealing a thigh. When it came to, to dressing up the, the priests, they had to wear a linen garment right down, right down to their ankles. They had breeches on, and they were covered up because seeing any part of the body was, particularly the thigh, would be viewed as nakedness. Do you think Christ is going to expose his thigh and go against what the Word of God would teach? That's the first thing. Leviticus 16 verse 4 will tell you uh, what uh, the, some of the garments that they had to wear. It is possible that the name will be just on the garment. Uh, it may even be on the weapon because in Psalm 45 verse 3 it says, Gird thy sword upon thy thigh. And obviously it's not on the thigh. It's down uh, the side of the leg. Uh, so it's probably a name that's going to be written on, on some uh, form of a covering worn by the priests. Some believe it's the Jewish prayer shawl. And this shawl had, had different knots in the end. And, and I don't fully understand it, but when these knots are tied in a certain way that spells out letters that the Hebrews would understand. And some believe when Christ's coming back, when he's sitting down, uh, that, that his prayer shawl will be down over his thighs, uh, and you'll be able to read the title, the title of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's certainly no suggestion that it's on his thigh, and there's no suggestion the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealing his thigh. But here's the thing tonight. If Leviticus forbids tattooing, if it was against the law, and the Lord Jesus Christ who come to fulfill the law, and the Word of God says if you, if you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking it all. And I say this reverently this evening. If Jesus Christ has a tattoo and it goes against the teaching of Leviticus 19, it makes him a sinner and he can't be your savior. And that's blasphemy. That's why it's serious to me. It's no laughing matter. When some young preacher gets up and just throws out a comment like that, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to have a tattoo on, he's speaking blasphemy. And I'm amazed at those who are sucked in. I'm really amazed. Because they haven't sat down and read their Bible and thought of what this person's saying. I look at it historically. I look at it practically. I look at it sadly. I look at it biblically. I look at it blasphemously. Let me finish off looking at it prophetically. As I said, tattoos have become so common. If you're still in Revelation 19, go back to Revelation 13. We'll finish this as quickly as we can. As I said, one in five in the United Kingdom have a tattoo. When you come to the younger generation, it's one in three. It's more popular now among ladies, particularly ladies between 26 and 46, seem to be craving to have tattoos. And so it covers all genders, 
and all peoples, and it seems to be all ages. And of course, the pop stars and the footballers are making it look so popular. As I said the other evening, Mark Lawrence said that, that these footballers have gone mad when it comes to tattoos. They've gone mad. And our young people, our children, look up to these people. And they see them decorated around their shoulders and around their legs. And this, if I want to be a good footballer, this is what I need. Tattoos are so acceptable and so common. And I believe there's a reason for it. Look at Revelation 13, verse 16. And here's Antichrist, an Antichrist ruling and reigning. And this is what he's going to do. He causeth all, both small and great. You see the standing? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they're big people or small people. You see their substance, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor. It doesn't matter how much they have in the bank. It's no good to them. You see their status, free or bond, whether they're an employer or an employee. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. These are people that have been left behind. They're in the tribulation period. Antichrist says... Uh, no matter whether you're big or small, rich or poor, free or bond, you're going to receive a mark. You see it? That's their stamp. You see the standing, the substance, the status, and then you see the stamp. To receive a mark, a tattoo, in their right hand or their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six, 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 six. You see the stipulation. Unless you've got the mark, unless you've got Antichrist's tattoo, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. And as you sit down and you think about it, and you see widespread tattooing, it's not going to cost people a thought to get the tattoo of Antichrist. They're going to have to be visibly marked. I don't know how he's going to do it. Of course, you can put chips under the skin. You can do a lot of things. But it says they're going to be marked. So it has to be visible. And we have a world that has visible marks all over them now. Another one's not going to matter one tiny wee bit. I believe the world has been prepared for Antichrist. I think the world's getting ready for that day. Before Antichrist comes, Christ will come. As I said the other evening, before the man of sin comes, the sinless man's coming. And Jesus is coming to the air. And those of us who are saved are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And if you're not saved, you're left behind. And I'll tell you, when you're told you can't buy, you can't sell unless you have the mark, it'll be an easy thing. In a society that's marked from head to foot, it'll be an easy thing to get the mark won't cost them a thought. The world's getting ready for Antichrist to come. And tonight, you need to come to Christ. You want to be in Christ before Jesus Christ comes back. Or you could find yourself dealing with Antichrist. As many as received him, to them give you the power to be called the sons of God, even to them but believe in his name. Satan wants to tattoo you. Antichrist will want to tattoo you. I believe Jesus is coming, and you need to be ready. A number of years ago, as a young boy, probably 14 or 15, I went into Sailor Bill's tattoo parlor in Coleraine. And I was sitting in the waiting room. Some of my family were in. Kenny wasn't there at that time, but I've Others in my family have tattoos and their boyfriends were getting tattoos and I was sitting and I was trying to pick out which one I would get. It probably would have been something political, knowing me. It been something that I wouldn't want to show today. Uh, thankfully, I chickened out. Thankfully, I chickened out. I believe the Lord's hand was on it. But let me tell you about Sailor Bill. Sailor Bill was there and I, I used to watch him and, and he would do the drawing and then the sun... Young Bill, I can't remember his name, I'll call him Young Bill, he would color it in. 
Uh, and so they were working. Uh, one was doing the outline, and one was then coloring it in, and this wee thing that shot the needles into the arm. Uh, and the dad was Sailor Bill. And Sailor Bill got saved. He got saved, as far as I know, from reading his testimony. And I tried to get the track, and I couldn't find it. But I remember reading the tract, and he got saved in a, I think it was a Neelam church in Coleraine. And the moment he got saved, he realized that he couldn't mark anybody's body. And he walked out of the business. He says, I can't do that anymore. That's what used to happen when people got saved. They knew there were new creatures in Christ Jesus. They knew they were going to be different. And they wanted to live their life by the Word of God. And believe her tonight, God hasn't changed, and this book hasn't changed. And we don't want to go with the flow tonight. If you're not saved tonight, the Lord can turn your life around and make you a child of God. I believe the world's getting ready for Antichrist. You need tonight to get ready for Christ. That's bound a moment's prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for thy word this evening. Lord, we pray you'll bless it. Lord, if any of it's of me, Lord, I would just ask that it'll fall to the ground. But Lord, that which is of thee this evening, we just pray that the Spirit of God might take it and bring it home to hearts tonight. For those of us who are saved, Lord, help us, Lord, to be ever looking upwards. Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. We pray, Lord, that we'll be able, like John, to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. But, Lord, there may be a believer here tonight. And the Apostle John talks about those who will be ashamed at his coming. Lord, we pray tonight that they'll get things sorted out. That they'll not be ashamed, but they'll love his appearing. Lord, there may be some here tonight, I don't know, and they're out of Christ and without a Savior. Lord, if you were to come back tonight, and you could come tonight, Lord, what an awful time they're going to have. And lost in hell for all eternity. Lord, will you speak? Will you see him? For we ask it in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing in closing.